what is the role of Al Sharpton because of the fact that many people are confused, you know, and we need to know, like, what, I mean, do you feel that he's a, a legitimate activist? Because I, I happened to uh, be absolutely bored the other day, and I'm, I'm, I'm going through the car radio, and his show, Keeping It Real, comes on, right? And the first thing they say is uh, America's number one uh, community activist or, you know, a civil rights activist, so on and so forth. What, what, what is his role? Because, you know, the people are confused. In a, in a case like this right here, what, what, what purpose does he serve? Well, the purpose that he serves immediately, and he's always served, is to diffuse any real, any real development of unity in the black community around a radical alternative to the status quo. Hmm. That's his whole job. His whole job is to redirect the energy to redirect the politics, to define the issues and the parameters of the debate so that we go, so that we wind up marching down streets, chanting, you know, um, uh, 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 black political uh, elite and middle class um, 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 uh, sympathizers are able to come to a demonstration, call up Al and, and individuals like him, arrange for a date and a time to be arrested, come to the demonstration, get arrested so they could appear on the six o'clock news and so that their name could say celebrities are uh, uh, um, uh, arrested in protesting Trayvon Martin verdict or whatever the case may be, yeah. you know. Um, so so their role is very simple. It's, it's the old role that the Negroes on the plantation played for the for the plantation master is to make sure that the niggas on the plantation didn't get out of hand, didn't start thinking about real power, and most of all, didn't start thinking about marching on, on the plantation house and slitting the plantation master's throat. That's the purpose of the Al Sharptons. Now, <clears throat> whether Al Sharptons is a legitimate activist, I would argue that he is. I would I would take that he is a legitimate activist. He's a legitimate activist in the sense that he could not be encapsulated by the system. He could not be used by the system if he didn't enjoy a certain level of legitimacy and viability in the black community. And this is pointed out by the fact that almost all of these families, to my understanding, especially this last incident with the Brown family, asked for Al Sharpton. They called Al Sharpton, and Al Sharpton said himself on TV that he never volunteers to go to these cases. The people, the family, ask him to come and speak for them. Now, this tells you exactly why the Brown family, this tells you exactly what I'm talking about. If you have wrote out all of the radical traditions and struggles of black people and their contribution to where we are at today in society, in terms of integration, in terms of, of, of acceptability, limited acceptability or whatever, if you write all of that out of history, you know, then who else are the families going to call for? They can't call for some, a hero of Malcolm X because nobody even knows that Malcolm X ex even existed. And if they did, they have this, this, this capsulated notion of what Malcolm X was. I mean, Malcolm X is on a, is on a, is on a United States postal stamp. Right. Huh? Right. So, 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 I mean, he's being Malcolm and the radical condition is, is claimed by the United States status quo but it's not claimed by the black bourgeoisie and the black middle class. And you got to understand something. The integrationist movement was led by people like Al Sharpton. Okay? People have to understand that Dr. Martin Luther King, when he be, as he came out of this middle class uh, um, um, uh, assimilationist attitude and began to understand the United States as an imperialist power, as a war-making power, as a power that's violated the human rights and killed people abroad in unjust wars, as he became aware of this, he moved closer and closer to the working class. And when he died, he died marching for working class sanitation workers. Right. Okay? But it was the, it's the black middle class, it's the black professional class and their children that have benefited from the civil rights movement the most. And these are the people right now that rush to these scenes, that dominate all of these scenes, that dominate the dialogues on television, that dominate the media, and that dominate everything when we start talking about these issues of police murder and police brutality. 
Okay, so so the, the role of Al Sharpton is the same role that the CIA would use in Africa when it wanted to uh, take over the mineral resources of a country. It will get its leaders, its middle class leaders, its most educated elite. It will educate their children. It will provide them with security. It will provide them with a, with, a, with, a, with a platform and a network so that their voices couldn't be heard and so that they become the leaders of the country and then they strike business deals with them. Ask Al Sharpton now why he no longer has to go around wearing a wire and begging for money from the mob or trying to get involved in selling selling drugs for the mob. It's because Al Sharpton is very wealthy now. And he's wealthy because of his activism. You have activists that are dirt poor that can't even pay the rent. And I ask you, which activist which activist activism is worthy of being paid by the state and being paid by the black uh, elite and which activist is worthy of being ostracized and, and, and demonized by the state and you make your own decision hmm. so um, Al getting there on the news saying he's not a uh, rat he's a cat was uh he didn't miss a beat <laughs> he didn't miss a beat in fact I mean I'm quite sure the Browns who called Al Sharpton to be their spokesman didn't know anything about this right. and if they did they probably would have rationalized it. I mean, you have people rationalize it right now. After they hear this, they're going to rationalize this and say, well, if it wasn't for Al Sharpton, we would, there wouldn't have been a Trayvon Martin trial. But the point is, if there wasn't an Al Sharpton, if there wasn't an Al Sharpton, there might have been a more direct response to Tray Trayvon Martin's murder. Hmm. Okay? There might have been a response that the police respect the most. And we need to understand something. People that beat you and murder you and bully you and intimidate you don't respect you. Have no respect for you. And if you sit down without any political power to retaliate, without any political power to get justice, without any political power to make them feel that there are consequences for their actions, that anything that they give you is a deference, anything that they give you is a gift. What's going to come out of the Gardner case? The chokehold was already abandoned. They're going to talk about new training procedures have to come out of the case. What's going to come out of this boy's murder? That 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 this count that this particular town in Missouri needs more black police officers. Already they're talking about there's 53 officers in the town and only two of them are black. So now we're going to have more black police officers. We're down here in Georgia where the majority of cops are black and they and they and they run in the plantation. Right. So now we're going around in circles. More police officers in, 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 in the black community, if they don't live there, is meaningless. Right. More police officers, in, more corrections officers in, 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 in a system that mass incarcerates black, black folks, more black correction officers in that system doesn't mean anything. Mm. It doesn't mean anything. They're drawing a paycheck off of our mass incarceration. Okay, so they become stakeholders in mass incarceration. So they become the individuals that end up on these programs talking about how prisons should go. We electing people to office. We electing former cops to represent us in the city council. That's how scrambled up we are. And these cops are coming in talking about, yeah, I was on the police force for 47 years, and if anybody's qualified to talk about this, it's me. But for 47 years, that police cop, those that police force killed 47 young black men, and you ain't did shit. Right. You ain't said nothing. <laughs> so now you're running for office talking about you know how it is, you know about racism, police should be doing this and should be doing that. Right. And you vote, and people will vote for him. So my point is, is that people like the Martin family, pe people like the Brown family, people like Ferguson's family, they don't know about Al Sharpton's um, a CD pass and opportunism. They don't know about. All they see is Al Sharpton, the Reverend, who's marching out there when families don't have nothing, who brings a little money to pay for the funeral, who brings a Jewish lawyer to represent them or a black lawyer to represent them. The fact that the lawyer that represented Trayvon Martin and lost the case because he didn't pursue that case the way he should, he wasn't aggressive in that case the way he should. The fact of the matter that 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 he lost that case doesn't mean anything. Right. He's right there now with the um, with the Brown family representing them. He's going to lose that case too. He's also the lawyer for uh, Kendrick Johnson out in um, in um, in Valdosta, Georgia. So you have lawyers who are activists. Or, um, let me put it this way. So you have some lawyers who may be well motivated, who may feel that their calling in, in law should be put to the use and the defense of black people, and therefore they get sucked in by people like Al Sharpton. Mm. 
Right. Or they get sucked in by by a, a, a belief in the court system that they can make a difference and they go into the courts and they fight for you. That's nothing wrong with them. And there's nothing wrong with them having that attitude. There's nothing there's nothing better than a people's attorney. Right. And I know from experience that get in that courtroom to fight these people, you need someone that's on your side that's unafraid. Okay, that's a lawyer that's unafraid of the power of the court. That that lets politics, your politics, lead your defense. Okay, right. the Brown family has no politics. Al Sharpton is providing the mass line and the politics for this family and presenting it to the public as if this is their sentiments. Right. You know. Right. Nobody, no mother wants other children wants wants other mothers to lose their child because they lost their child. That's not what a mother's vibing on. That's why. That's why when you talk about a movement, you're not talking about the individual, the individual cases. You're talking about the collective situation. You're talking about the collective uh, uh, process. In America, black people are only allowed to rise up as high as all black people are allowed to rise up. And they set up these little examples, whether they're rich millionaires, whether they're black entrepreneurs, to, to say to us, don't give up, keep struggling, keep striving, get an education, and you'll be successful. Hmm. Okay? And we've proven that getting an education doesn't immune you from the nine millimeter bullets of the pole pole. It doesn't immune you from the from the from the arrogance of the warrior cop in America. It doesn't immune you from the fact that your ass in America is grass if you don't have any particular if you don't have no power. And that's where we are at right now. We are surrounded by misleaders and a comprador class, a middle class that is bent on taking us to destruction for their own personal aggrandizement and wealth and benefit um what what do you what we, we, we're hearing about all these shootings we see the youth uh, uh rising um and and we see you know like you said the reverend Al's and so many other people are trying to stop that rise um what what should the uh in these cases in the the michael brown case in the case of john crawford uh the 22 year old who was gunned down in walmart for picking up a a uh, a toy gun that they sell in their store and being murdered in the aisle that he's in with the with the 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 the, the, the merchandise that that he's getting from them. <laughs> what 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 do we what should the people do? I mean, uh, Eric Garner case, so on and so forth. Because we get a lot of people hitting us up saying, you know, uh, we want to do something. You know, what do we do? Do we march? Do we rally? We get some people say we're tired of marching. We're tired of rallying. I'm gonna say something. Let me say something here. I'm I'm I'm, I'm gonna say something here. You know, marching and rallying has utility, but only when you have a movement. Only when you have a mass movement. Only when you have a popular movement does marching have any effect. Boycotts only work when you have the masses of people organized so that it has an economic impact an immediate economic impact on the locality in which the boycott is being organized. Absent a movement, absent this type of mass organization, these, these, these things today in the 21st century are useless because we see how marchers now, they, they're not even allowed to approach the, uh, the buildings where they're protesting against. You could have senators sitting in the building or state councilmen sitting in the council's office and the demonstrators are five blocks away cordoned off into a particular area. Sharpton is supposed to lead a, 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 demonstra a march across the Varazano Bridge, which is one of the largest bridges in America, into Staten Island, which is the home and the bastion of a lot of NYPD police families and stuff. So he was going to lead a march across the Varazano Bridge, the Staten Island Bridge, from New York, from Manhattan, into, uh, in, from, excuse me, from Brooklyn, into uh, Staten Island, where, God, you know, um, where the policemen uh, who killed Gardner is from. The police chief in New York, Stratton, Bratton, contacts Al Sharpton and says, look, man, you know, if you lead a march across this bridge, you know, it's going to disrupt traffic. It's going to mess up, you know, um, uh, public safety for hours and hours. This is one of the largest bridges. It's going to back up traffic all across New York. Why don't you take buses across the bridge and let them deliver you at the venue where you can demonstrate? Now, could you imagine being bussed across the Pettus Bridge um, when 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 um, when 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 King went back to uh, in in, in um, it, Wallace and him. yeah when he went when 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 he crossed the um, the uh, in Alabama, in Alabama? So, yeah okay so 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 
I mean, what if the king said, okay, cool, man, we're going to get beat up, you know, we're going to get spit on by the Ku Klux we're going to take a bus. <laughs> you see? So, so, the purpose of the demonstration was specifically to do that, to disrupt business as usual, That's to let people point. know that this issue is so important to us, and while it ain't important to you, we'll make it important to you. You, your ass won't get to work this morning. You would have to deal with this fact that we live under this terror every day rather than this little inconvenience that you stuck in traffic. That was the whole purpose of the demonstration. Because it's not a part of a movement, so it can't be an ongoing thing. The boycott, the Montgomery boycott, was an ongoing affair that went on for days and days and days until the bus company was brought to its knees economically. Okay, this is not happening today because we have leaders like Al Sharpton and them and these types of individuals who make sure that all of this rage and all of this animosity is directed towards empowering some Democrat in power, to, to, to verifying some Democrat in power. Every time a Brown or a Gardner invites a, a Al Sharpton to, one, to, to be their spokesman, he becomes a legitimate kingmaker in the Democratic Party. He becomes an a, 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 a asset to the Democratic Party of Hillary Clinton and Obama and he, and he has his pulse on the people and he's, he's a part of the people. This is what they're going to say. Okay? So we have to understand something here. That recently the police in mass went to a funeral. I believe it was in California. I'm not sure. Is California or Detroit? I, 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 I forget. But I think it's California. There's this young brother by the name of Mixon. His last name is Mixon. He was pulled over by the by two by two uh, he was California by two California highway patrolmen. Okay, he waxed their ass. He shot both of them. Right, and escaped. They said they traced him to another house where he was where he was um, uh, uh, um, boarded up in. And he killed two SWAT team sergeants that came to get him. And they wound up killing him. Now here's this guy. They said he was a criminal. There was a warrant out for his arrest. And I believe the warrant out for his arrest was for some was some was for something basically not that, you know, not, not that serious. It could have been traffic, it could have been a violation of parole, something like that. Right. But this man shot both police officers and shot the two SWAT team officers and policemen came from all over North America, from Canada, from Toronto, from all over North America to the funeral of these police officers. You had helicopters that flew over from other venues to be at this funeral. There was 10,000 cops at this funeral. Now how did they get there? Whose money was they using? Whose vehicles did they use? That's the taxpayers' money. They was at this person's funeral and what it shows you is that the elevation of, of, of the police into the special into the special brand of humanity in which their lives are sacred and our lives are insignificant has gone to the point where the state has, has allowed this massive amount of funds to be used as an outpouring of, of grief and sympathy because this is an agent of the state. He is a guardian of the status quo. Okay, and he was murdered. But the point I want to make is about is about Mixon, because this guy who we know little about, very very likely understood that the police that were pulling him over would kill him, and we don't know what happened, cause they dead, and he's dead, and he know and we know for a fact the SWAT teams coming in our house that there was sometimes there's no means of surrender. He knew, that man knew, that after those two policemen were killed, even if he didn't do it, he wasn't going to be allowed to surrender. Okay? The, sink, the point, the reason why I bring this up is when you say, what should people be doing? I'm saying right now, right here, the same thing that I've been saying for the last 40 years. You understand? There can be no reconciliation unless there's funerals on both sides. If there's only funerals on our side of the equation, there's no such thing as reconciliation. There'll be no such thing as justice. Hmm. Okay? So like my old brother said, you know, I don't know, I ain't going to go into that. That's, <laughs> that's kind of profane. But I just want to say that retribution as a principle has always been an integral part of justice, especially under the Christian, Islamic, and Jewish traditions. Okay? Right. Diplomatically, the United States 
said that when 911 happened, that those that were responsible for 911 were going to pay with their lives for it. They were talking about retribution. Justice, you remember that, you remember what Bush's words were? They were going to be brought to justice. He used the word justice and retribution interchangeably. So why are we restricted to demonstrations, civil rights, marches, and there is no retribution? These crackers could murder us with impunity. They're armed to the teeth, and their SWAT teams are out there. They have a they have a monopoly of manpower and weaponry. They have all of that. But there's one thing that we got that they don't have. We have masses of people. There's 40 million black folks in this country. Right. Pl playing crackers advocate. Uh, we have these folks that say, uh, you know, what you saying, you know, get people hurt, so on and so forth, and that sounds violent, this and that. Um, what, what do you say to that? Because of the fact that, again, there's, um, you know, a lot of our folks, you know, we've read different comments. We have folks that pretty much make up every excuse under the sun, under the sun to uh, not even resist. Some people won't even march. You know what I'm saying? They, they won't even... I mean, they'll defend the situation or they'll justify it, you know, in saying something like, uh, you know, we kill each other every day. I, I saw something that a, a rapper posted yesterday saying that um, we don't get outraged when we kill each other. What do you say to that? Well, I feel first of, first of all, I say they're not, they're not the same thing. That's the first thing. Any, any dope could see that. The murder by the state and murder because you got a beef with somebody over their shoes or their Jordans or because you don't like them when you had a beef at a club or because you're beefing over drugs is qualitatively different. Okay, but having said that, you know, all you got to do is go back and read fans for known about self-hatred and how the natives readily kill each other. Then when it comes time to deal with the oppressor, they throw their guns away. Okay, because they fear the state, they fear the system more than they fear each other. But having said that, I want to address the 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 the, the, the larger issue that that, that 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 you raised there. That 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 people say, well, you know, you know that that what you're saying could only lead to to people being killed and people being murdered. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a brother that was murdered. We are, we, there's so many of these incidents that have happened over the past six months. We can't even remember them all. So we're being killed and murdered anyway. Right. Okay, we're being we're being shuttled through the police system anyway. Okay, we're going to prison at a phenomenal rate anyhow. Our children are being raised in this violent society anyway. Okay, so 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 what do we really have to lose? Okay, when we look at this in that context. See, it's not possible, it's true, for everyone to step forward and perhaps do certain things a certain way. But it is true that any successful people's movement that does not have the capacity to exert itself physically on its opposition is never going to be successful. And it has never been successful. Now all we have is lawyers and preachers and, 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 and inspirational speakers as leaders. Okay? And they're the ones that's telling us how to handle this case. Okay? You, they are the ones that's telling us how to deal with this. But the fact of the matter is, we are living in a militarized national security state. Okay? And, and the most glorified individuals, the most glorified class in this state is the Praetorian class. The elite um, uh, uh, military and police units. They are glorified as heroes. All of the rest of the cops, okay, on the beat, the knuckleheads in the police station, they're all anti-heroes. They're heroes with issues. Okay? But the ones that we see on TV, the ones that killed Osama bin Laden, they're all glorified as history. Last Man Standing, Stand Alone, all of these movies glorify these murderers. Okay, these are trained, cold, calculated killers. But they kill on behalf of the empire. They kill on behalf of the status quo. And because of that, they're heroes. So what I'm saying is, they are amongst us soldiers too. There are amongst us brothers and sisters who are tired of this, but what they don't understand is that without the capacity for retribution, we can't build an effective movement. And an effective movement can't be built without that capacity. So this goes uh, hand in glove. Martin Luther King wouldn't have got all of the rap that he got, wouldn't have got all of the props that he got if Malcolm X didn't exist. Okay? The NAACP founded by Jews who felt compelled to come to the aid of victimized blacks would it not have been relevant in the, in the 20s and 30s when the Ku Klux Klan was burning and killing people if there wasn't, if there didn't arise out of that 
um, organizations like the Deacons for Self Defense and the Black Panther Party of Lowndes County. Okay? Whenever we write out a radical alternative, whenever we write out the right to self defense out of uh, the entire equation, we are hamstrung. We are, we are running a race with one leg. And that's the component that's missing right now. And that's why the dialogue doesn't proceed the way it is. That's why we're not getting anything out of this dialogue because the enemy doesn't fear us. The people that are murdering us are arrogant enough to believe that they have a right to do this and that we are the criminals. Look at how the cops was talking to the people in Ferguson, calling them savages and animals. Mm -hmm. This is what they believe, that their way of life, that they are protecting a way of life and they're protecting themselves from animals and savages. Mm -hmm. That's what they believe. You know, and it goes right back to the old axiom that the white folks used when they took America. The only good savage is a dead savage. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. The only good nigger is a dead in, is a dead nigger. Okay, that's how they thought when they founded this country and it enslaved us, and that has permeated the institution of policing in America today. It hasn't gotten too far away from that. Okay, and so when we fail to realize where we came from and how we resisted all of these years, we haven't survived America because we just laid down and rolled over and said we're gonna deal with the courts. We haven't survived America because Nat Turner didn't exist, because Denmark Vesey didn't strike terror in the hearts of white folks, because John Brown didn't strike terror in the hearts of white folks. That the Civil War wasn't for a decidedly violent endeavor. If the Civil War wasn't fought and black folks weren't armed and got into the Civil War on behalf of the Union, which would have lost probably on a manpower tip, if that didn't happen, what discussion would we be having now? So when people say to you that we're only going to get killed, you know, that we're only going to get this, I'm saying to you that you cannot bring anybody to the negotiating table for justice and being treated as an equal until there's funerals on both sides. You listen to Contraband Classified Radio. Again, this is uh, Kalanji Jamachanga with the Ruba Ben Wahad speaking on the recent incidents uh, across America dealing with police terrorism. Um, in closing, the Ruba for folks who um, are, are into into um, into preventive medicine, uh, for folks who want to know what could be done to avoid being murdered by police if there's a such a thing. Um, what do you say? What are some of the solutions that you can uh, suggest? <laughs> I would tell you what they tell you in jail in order to stay out of the box and in order not to get not to get into any beefs. They tell you in jail to drink plenty of water and walk slow. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's going to work here, right? <laughs> well, left. I mean, if you got Al Sharpton and them leading you, you might as well drink plenty of water and walk slow because you're going to be doing plenty of marching and you're going to have to be doing it for a long time and you're not going to achieve very much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, drink plenty of water and march slow. All right. Brother, we appreciate your words. Anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Well, you know, um, I'm saying this situation, it cannot be um, addressed in its entirety by one solution or one attitude or one analysis only. However, my point is that when you exclude an entire analysis and an entire tradition of resistance from the equation, then black folks don't have a clue about what they should about what's, what's available to them, what's, what alternatives do they have. Black folks don't know that, for instance, the so-called BLA, the Black Liberation Army, wasn't just a bunch of uh, 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 half a dozen or a dozen or 20 black young men and women running around the streets shooting cops. That wasn't what it is. The, black, the BLA had a whole network of people who had houses, who had jobs, who had community, who were community figures, who were entrepreneurs, who supported the underground materially supported the underground and these people are unknown to this day and so whenever you are whenever we are whenever resistance is portrayed as something adventuristic or something that's just emotional we need to understand in order to resist you have to build a resistance movement and a resistance movement means that you have to survive in a state of war and you have to survive in a continuous state of repression, in a continuous state of restriction. And that's your movement. So now if we build the types of networks that could help us survive, we would have known who po this policeman was. We would have knew where he, he lived the day he did it. We would have known everything there is to know about these individuals who are in our community with guns policing us. And they would know that we know, and therefore they would act 
act accordingly. They think that they are immune. They think that they are anonymous. They think that they cannot be had. And as long as they think that way, we're going to keep revisiting this type of issue. Phenomena of authoritarian national security states is a global phenomenon, Davey D. And the United States is the leading um, uh, 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 advocate of this. So therefore, when we look at something like surveillance and, we, and, and, and in our communities, it was the same people, Davy, these same type of mentality that was fearful of black youth, fearful of our children, who called for more police in our community who call for the war on drugs to be escalated in our community to fill these jails with prisoners. And now, 20 years after they did this, they're moaning about how the jails are filled with our youth and how our children are tracked from school to prison. But they're the ones that created this, and they did it out of fear. They were fearful of our, their own children. They were fearful of our own people in our own community. Instead of, the, instead of putting neighbors, the word neighbor back in hood, they left the word hood and hoodie and became afraid of that. They ran from that. And that's what's happening in Oakland right now. This country is built, the national security state can only function when people are afraid. And when they're afraid of everything. And when we have our black elected officials, many of them who, who, who've never set foot in the projects or, 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 or sat down with a gang banging set and, 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 and kicked the Willie Bobo with them, these same individuals will vote on the city council to put cameras and surveillance in their community. You understand the surveil their activities. If you remember, the Black Panther Party started out, started out in Oakland, California, over the over the fact that there was no traffic light at a busy intersection, and this intersection had killed a number of black children. Remember, a traffic light, right? Mm -hmm. Even a traffic light there. You, and, 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 and the Negroes at that time who were on the city council didn't demand no traffic light. But now we have, 40 years later or whenever, or 50 years later, we have black city council members calling for more surveillance in the black community. Calling for, rather, they're not talking about community control or public safety. They're talking about the institution of the national security state, its public safety apparatus, which we know to be racist, which we know to be classist, which we know to, to, to suborn injustice. They're calling for them to watch us. Wow. I, mean, you can't, I mean, you can't get no more backwards than that. And because we don't have an independent political base, because we don't have independent political clubs in Oakland, these people cannot be called to account. When election time comes, how many people are going to remember that, that, that a knucklehead councilman called for more cameras in the black community? Huh? How many of them are going to remember that this guy caused that and vote his ass out of office? Not too many. So, so, so what I'm trying to say here, Davey, is that, <clears throat> is that the black uh, uh, supporters of the status quo are a reflection of the ambivalence of African Americans in this country. We are ambivalent about our citizenship. When the Trayvon Martin issues happen, we realize that we are black in America and that we are really not full citizens, citizens or our humanity considered. When, when those crises and those issues are not happening, we are out there talking about inclusion and success and worshiping wealth and worshiping these media icons and these people running around um, uh, driving expensive cars and wearing uh, and, and, and living ostentatiously. So we are ambivalent about who we are, Davey. I mean, and, and that's reflected in the fact that we have a mixed race president and we think he's black. How could you possibly think this guy is black? And then people say, well, what's black? He's not black enough for you. What is that? So we wind up arguing about who's blacker than who. What kettle can call what other pot black? Okay? A total facetious argument. A total facetious argument <clears throat> because the argument was settled back in the civil, during the civil rights movement. The terminology of using black and African was a result of a process, a process of, of, of civil disobedience, a process of, 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 of developing concepts of self and self-love and self-appreciation, okay, to the point where even exploitation, the word black was put in front of it, black exploitation. This is what we have movies, capitalism, black was put in front of it. Why was black put in front of all of these things that are basically negative? Because to put black in front of exploitation and call it black exploitation, 
because of black because because there's black actors in it means that we are satisfied with superficial success and 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 we are satisfied with superficial success and that means that the, that entails that the hair we have on our head and whether we're wearing a dashiki or 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 whatever and so we have been duped and deceived into reinventing the same processes and struggles every generation. So this generation, we have the struggles between uh, a, a wealthy and uh, affluent, uh, a young uh, uh, um, a millionaire class, to, uh, um, to, to, to use that term. But at the same time, we have no political power. We don't have one refugee and relief agency that's run by us. If, if Katrina was to happen tomorrow, these same movie stars and, 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 um, and rap artists would get on television and do a marathon for the Red Cross or for the Salvation Army. We don't have our own refugee and relief agency. And when we look around the world, we see that that, that means that we are unable to come to the assistance of ourselves. We are unable to look out for ourselves. And because we are unable to look out for ourselves, we take the state, we say that the state, because we're paying taxes, should look out for us. And, 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 and that's the basis of why Sharpton will call for a focus on the stand your ground law rather than a focus on why we don't have a right to stand our ground. Hmm. We have a right to self-defense. But that's not an issue, you see. And it's not an issue because if we claim that right to self-defense, all of the support that the Sharptons have and all of the support that these Negroes have would evaporate overnight because white folks are scared of black people with guns. They're scared of black people who would stand their ground. They're afraid of a whole nation, 40 million people, who were this for 500 years, realizing that they are human beings and have a right to control their own destiny and control their own communities by any means necessary, which includes violence which includes self Wow. And and that's a lot that's a lot to take in and 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 good good solid food for thought. We've been talking with Daruba Ben Wahad, um getting his reaction to the Bradley Manning thing and and connecting the dots to the larger issues at hand. You know, if you had a magic wand, what would be three things that you were, or two or three things that you say that we need to do to move this this situation forward? The police state is in full gear. Um, we have, you know, a president that's uh, cracking down on whistleblowers. We have pundits that are co-signing the president's uh, draconian policies, even though those same opponents were opposed to him when Bush was doing them. We have a lot of confusion. Um, and, and, you know, we have people who are whistleblowers being called traitors by people who themselves are okay. having their own citizenship uh, question you know, by the form of birthers and everybody else. So we have a lot of layered and, and, and misdirection going on, but how do we fight out of this, you know, moving forward? I think that the, that, that the most important thing, one of the most important things we have to understand is that we are living under a national police state, that the United States has been militarized, um, has been socially and culturally militarized, and that fear is the predominant, uh, uh, um, a weapon by which the state uh, 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 that, that the state uses to manipulate people's emotions and politics. So I think that the first thing that we need to do is that we need to challenge the political power of the police, the political influence of the of, of those forces of the national security state that relies on the armed agents of the state. We have to challenge the political power of the police. And to do that, we have to create in every city, in every urban area where there are concentrations of African people, we have to create uh, uh, um, uh, instruments to control the police, to control public safety. We have to take on the political power of the unions, the police unions. We have to really, really do that because it's the police unions that drive these unjust policies of mass incarceration. It's the police who rely on crime in order to um, uh, uh, justify political repression. You know, the political repression of the black community in, in, in the 60s and 70s was never called political repression. COINTELPRO and all of these, all of these other um, uh, uh, government programs never said that they were going after people because of their politics. They said that, they, that we were criminals, that we were terrorists. Terrorism is, 
is, is described as a crime. But we know that terrorism is much older than the United States and it's political. We all know that. We know that, for instance, if we look at Italy, all of the individuals on the, in the Red Brigade, all of the individuals who killed, actually killed policemen and killed po leading political figures, all of those individuals are out of prison. Mm. In Germany, all of the individuals who were in the Red Army faction and were in the Red Brigades are out of prison. When we look all over Europe, the political prisoners have spent 10 years or whatever, and they are out of prison. It's only in the United States where black political prisoners are still incarcerated after 40 years of imprisonment. 40 years! Why? Because there is no real opposition to the political power of the police. And the political power of the police, of course, resides in the military-industrial complex, in the ability to control the masses of people, in the ability to deal with civil, civil unrest. You know, Obama is just is getting ready to pass into law a new bill that will restrict and prohibit protests uh, uh, against certain officials. Against in certain areas, what happened to our freedom to uh, to assembly? What happened to the Occupy Wall Street movement? Who broke the Ac Occupy Wall Street movement? Was it was it their politics? It was the police. Mm. Who benefits from the from the uh, prison industrial complex? The police. Who gets money allocated for their uh, uh, new toys that they have? Every cop, every cop, every uh, uh, county police agency here in Georgia has has a new police car. A brand new police car, something at at at, at fifteen twenty thousand dollars each. Brand new police cars, but yet and still there are no programs in these communities right here in Riverdale, in, in in the community to help young black kids in the streets to 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 put them to doing something to to to, to occupy their time and give them some constructive uh, um, uh, uh, work. We know, for instance. The black community stop and frisk is not just about stopping black men and black men and frisking them uh, 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 because of racial profiling. Racial profiling is designed to ensure that black people, that a whole swath of black males, cannot legally own weapons. You cannot legally own a weapon if you have a criminal record. If you have even a misdemeanor arrest, you can't own a gun. So you are t trapping black men into a matrix in which they cannot defend themselves because you have Negroes like Sharpton taking away their right to self-defense on the one hand, and you have them being arrested by the cops so that they can't own legally own weapons on the other hand. And then in the community that they live in, it's flooded by guns, illegal guns, illegal weapons. And we know that so-called black-on-black crime is, was historically used to counter revolutionary activities in the black community. And count to counter police that the charges of police brutality and murder. That's why black and black crime was invented. And we know that black on black crime doesn't exist. It's a question of proximity and opportunity. Eighty six percent of white people kill each other. Do we talk about white on white crime? Right. No. So we need to understand that that at the same time that we're being disarmed through 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 programs and policies of the police. The police is increasing their power, increasing their surveillance, and increasing their ability to control us. And we're going along with the program. Every project that we have ever seen, David D., can be locked down and closed off in a matter of minutes by the police. And every resident in that project will be living in a prison. And we know that. And we don't do anything about it. We don't control public safety. There's no residency clause for police in our community. Huh? We don't control none of this. And yet and still, the faith-based communities, the so-called activists in the communities, are talking about, you know, turning your guns. Turn them in, no questions asked. But none of them are establishing gun clubs out of the churches in order to teach young people the proper use of weapons, self-defense, home defense, how to use weapons rec recreationally, while at the same time they're not doing that. In the white community, the gun ownership of white citizens has increased 400%. So this is not unrelated to Trayvon Martin. None of this is unrelated to, to Manning. It's the result of a militarized society that views the rights of people to self-defense as conditional only to those who are white. The, the Stand Your Ground law is an extension of the Castle law. And it's an extension because white folks have armed themselves to the teeth and they walk around this country swaggering with guns on their hips while black people in the community are cowering in the corner because they have no way to defend themselves from the political violence of the police and the racist violence of law enforcement. So we need to understand what this is all about. This is all about the political power of the police state. 
to determine our destiny, to control our lives, and to lock our asses up whenever they think that we are a threat. And unless we challenge that political power, we're not going to begin to unravel any of this stuff. So we need independent political parties that can go into the community and garner votes from people to take control of public safety, to put on the referendum, to put referendums on the ballot to control public safety. And we need to redefine what public safety means. It not only means police living in our community and policing our community based on our needs, based on our direction. It also means having effective emergency medical services. It also means having effective fire services. It also means reopening fire departments, firehouses in our community, and training young people to be volunteer firemen. So we need to understand that the political power of the police is the undergirding factor in the police state. That's why the first word before state is police. Well, there you have it. To Ruben ben Wahad, man, we appreciate you coming on, sharing with us these thoughts, very uh, insightful, a lot for us to mull over and, you know, to, to, to really, you know, stay focused on, on the larger picture at hand, that this is not uh, uh, a set this of not- isolated incidents. This is part of a much bigger thing. You said this in 2008, and you're saying of- that today. Yes, it is. It's part of a process. And we need to disrupt this process. Revolutionaries or radicals or activists or even even progressives need to understand that our foremost job right now is to provide our people with enough clarity so that they can disrupt the institutions of repression and authoritarianism that is determining our lives.